One thing I want you to notice is that every time we use language to misrepresent our internal truth, our inner reality, be it emotions, sensations, any type of experience that is subjective to ourselves, the aftertaste is always very bitter. In this video, I'm going to take you through some major ways in which we humans use language to misrepresent our internal truth, otherwise known as manipulations. We're going to see how we can start using language in a way that helps us reflect the authentic truth of ourselves and make our relationships kinder and more loving and more satisfying and happier as a result. If you're a student of non-duality, what I'm going to say in this video might be of special interest to you. I'm going to talk about representing the self that we all share, the pure awareness, the nothingness that births into everythingness that we are willing to represent as accurately as we can in the language that we speak. As an English teacher, I'm very interested in bringing this understanding into a language classroom so that when we're educating our learners to speak language, we're aware of the nature of language and we're aware that we can hold the freedom of either represent ourselves correctly or misrepresent ourselves. And the latter will result in a lot of confusion and also in a lot of dissatisfaction that comes up as that bitter aftertaste. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, doing some non-duality work and existential work might be of interest to you. But still, I think there will be value for you to, to look into the ways in which we use language to misrepresent ourselves. So the first type of situations in which we're likely to misrepresent ourselves is when we're afraid that sharing the truth of our internal state will result in rejection. Being rejected is one of the most scary situations and scenarios in a human life. This has to do with the trauma that we go through when we're being born. That's the first occasion of rejection that we might register in, 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 our, in our consciousness. Therefore, rejection is probably one of the most painful sensations that we might experience in our lifetime. Think about the most dramatic events in your life. The likelihood is that the most traumatizing experiences had to do with a type of rejection. Maybe a friend rejected you, maybe a lover said no to you, whatever it was. When we say something to another person, just to make sure that we don't get rejected, it's A, perfectly understandable, but B, if we don't feel like doing the thing that they're asking us to do and we're only doing or saying that thing because we don't want to be rejected, we make sure that we succumb to unhappiness. An example of being afraid of rejection might include something like saying yes if in reality you want to say no. For instance, for girls and ladies, it might be difficult to say no to a man who is wanting to have sex with her because we're afraid that if we don't have sex with the man, we might get rejected. Or it's like saying that a project is fantastic in a meeting when everyone else is saying that it's grand. But if you, you yourself have a dissatisfaction with that project and you don't stand up and speak about it, you're actually, in the end, doing a disservice to the whole meeting group because the remarks that you might have to bring to the table might actually be the things that will save the whole project from inevitable failure. Notice how you hold yourself back and try to brainstorm linguistic constructions and language in general that you may use to use in those situations. When we're saying no to someone, that does not mean that we're rejecting them. 
When we're saying no to someone, we need to make sure that we do that from a kind and loving position and that we speak the truth and remain honest in that interaction as much as we can. When a person is sensing that we're telling the truth, that we're being truly loving and compassionate, that we care about them, that we're not trying to aggrandize our own ego just to, just, just to feel good about ourselves by putting them down, the other person will register that and just believe me, they will feel it. And then the red rug will be rolled out for the third option that you can find together. The second type of situations is when we're feeling that we have to say that we understand when in fact we don't. It stems from rejection to a large degree. I agree with you about that. But here's the thing. In our culture, we value knowledge above everything. The person who knows and the person who understands is everyone's favourite. So we bend over backwards very often to create an impression that we do understand something when in fact we don't. I want you to notice in your life situations when you're afraid to ask for clarification. And just notice that in fact when you're in a social group and someone else asks for some clarification, you're actually feeling relieved because you're getting that extra information on certain occasions and you're actually valuing that person's behaviour when they're acting for cl clarification. Quite often we're thankful to the people who are not afraid to stand up and ask for clarification. I'm not talking about classroom situations when we might feel a little discouraged by people who look for details that much and take away from the effectiveness of the entire group. But I'm rather talking about situations when some genuine misunderstanding regarding the speaker's point is being registered in your consciousness. And on those occasions, it's actually a fantastic thing to do, to just say it out loud and to ask for that clarification. I go to teaching conferences all the time and one thing that I'm going to tell you with full certainty is that every time I go to a teaching conference there will be a point that a speaker might be making that might be a little bit confusing for some of the people in the audience and actually when someone stands up and asks for that clarification most people are quite thankful for that because there is high probability that in that audience there'll be one or two people who are not on the same page with the speaker. Plus, the speaker will be quite delighted to bring that point home to the audience because that's exactly the reason that they're there for. Bear that in mind. Don't be afraid. Asking for clarification does not make you stupid. Plus, I think that we need to get over this thing that has to do with obsessive desire for knowledge in our society because when we look inside very deeply we will discover that all we know about ourselves are just cultural assumptions, are the mirrored utterances that our parents and early caregivers have, have reflected back to us. In fact we know very little about reality, we know very little Mostly what we know is something that was programmed or cultured into us during the process of us growing up. In fact, what we're abiding in most of the time is pure not knowing. And pure not knowing, on a philosophical note, is quite important to knowing because it's the very fundamental space from which knowing arises. If we don't cultivate not knowing in our society, if we only praise people for knowing things, how on earth are we going to grow into conscious and honest human beings who are interested in empirical investigation of reality rather than just some assumption-driven ideas and life that we're used to living these days? The third type of scenarios when we use language to misrepresent ourselves is when we're exaggerating what's happened to us in order to impress the person we're talking to. Just notice how all our life, 
as we know it, is a constant attempt to impress someone else with how good we are. And it all stems from our sense of being separate. If we use language to intensify the perception of ourselves as a separate being who has to compete against everybody, what we actually end up doing is we end up catalyzing and exacerbating the belief in the separate self. If you're familiar with psychotherapy, you might have undergone some treatment or you've just done some psychology-oriented work or self-development work in your own good time. You may well know that such a thing as an ego is a combination of beliefs that the consciousness does or is being so that survival is accomplished. And that very consciousness, that very true nature of it, that we're all discovering, many, 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 many people around the world are discovering the true nature of our consciousness these days, other are also known as awakening or enlightenment. What is happening is we're discovering the true nature of it, and it's that very true nature that we're trying to represent. In that true nature, there is, there is room for everybody. There is no lack. There is abundance. There is infinite possibility for being anything you want, for being anything you can imagine. If you can imagine it, then you can manifest it, you can find it in a material manifestation. But without going too much into that law of attraction community talk, I just want to draw your attention to the occasions when we just use language to misrepresent our achievements. In fact, have you noticed that very often the people who are honest about their areas of incompetence are much more likeable and they stand a better chance of getting a good job, for instance, or to make friends with someone, for instance. The truth is, the relative truth is, that we're very good at sensing when a person is being inauthentic. We're very sensitive to each other's in, in, inauthenticity. So we can register it very easily when another person is trying to exaggerate their achievements so that they can impress us. Just think about someone in your environment who is prone to act like that from time to time. Notice how uncomfortable it may feel when they resort to that type of behaviour. Start noticing what their intonation is like, what their language is like. And start noticing, of course, why you do that. The reason why we use language to misrepresent ourselves is because we feel existentially because we're separate beings. But apart from that, on a more psychological level, we feel that we're at odds with everybody. We feel that we're in constant competition with everybody. That we have to win friends, we have to win partners, we have to win the entire world. Because that's something that we associate with success. And the better we get at manipulation, the more power we can generate in our reality. But one thing to bear in mind is that no misrepresentation will lead to happiness. And the reason for that is that deep inside you will always know that you're misrepresenting. Hence the unpleasant aftertaste that I referred to in the beginning of this video. I'm super grateful to you for watching this video, so thank you so much. Please click the like button and share this video with a friend. In the future, we'll talk a lot about how we use language to do certain things that are quotidian and very natural to us. For instance, how we use language to hurt other people. Once we grow conscious of those ways in which we use language and our whole being here on this planet is, is dictated by language, as is our sense of self, the more we become aware of it, the, the happier we will become. 
thank you so much once again and I'll see you again on this channel very very soon. Bye bye for now.